So we'll start with the Baal Shem Tev. There is a letter from the Baal Shem Tev himself in which the Baal Shem Tev is writing to his brother-in-law, whose name was Abgesh and Kitavit, who knew, who, the, who at a certain point figured out who the Baal Shem Tev was. Originally, the Abgesh and Kitavit thought the Baal Shem Tev was a Poshet Yid. At a certain point, the Baal Shem Tev revealed to his brother-in-law who he was while the Baal Shem Tev was still a Nistir. And Baal Shem Tev became a Rebbe when Baal Shem Tev revealed to himself. And when he the Baal Shem Tev, Abgesh and Kitavit was from the first people who supported the Baal Shem Tev, as a God of Yisrael, as a Talmud Chacham, and so forth. So there's a letter which the Baal Shem Tev wrote to Abgesh and Kitavir, where he's telling him, I don't know how the Baal Shem Tev knew this, who his neshama was in a previous Gilgul, who the Baal Shem Tev was in an earlier Gilgul. And he tells him the following story, that about 200 years ago, in other words, Baal Shem Tev is saying, about 200 years ago, which from now is quite difficult. 450 years ago, around the times that these are my figure, there was a Yid living on a Kaidish Tzvas. If I'm not mistaken, it doesn't say his name. And he was a very, he was an Ish Tam V'yashav Erelekim, very pious, good Jew, who just did everything you were supposed to. He was completely sincere, serious, and dedicated to Yiddishkeit. He was a Pashtarid, a simple man. And his avoider was very perfect. Everything he did is bright. Like he was always from the first people to come to the show, he was always from the last people to leave the show. Everything he did in Avedis Hashem was done wholly and sincerely and simply. One day, this Yid has a knock on his door and he asks, Who is by the door? And he's told, It's Aliyo and Navi Zachalatev. Aliyo and Navi Zachalatev. So he opened the door. Aliyo and Navi comes into his house. And the whole house comes filled with light. And the Yohan Nabi tells him that he is a shliach from the Bezdin Shalmailo. Because on the day of his bar mitzvah, this is this man, did something extraordinary, <clears throat> very, very special. That it was so special that even the Bezdin Shalmailo doesn't know what it was. So he was sent as a shliach from Milo to come to this Yid and make with him a deal, an offer. That the, if he will reveal what he did in David's Bar Mitzvah, which the Bamali Shabbat doesn't know, he will teach him Kala Terekula. Nigle Nister, Sichas Dekolim and Sichas Eifes, he'll teach him all the secrets of the Tere, even the language of the trees and the birds, Alts, Allah say this, everything the rest of the whole teaching. So this Pasha the Yid said to Yo, and now he what I did in the name of my bar mitzvah. I did for the Eibishter alone, and I won't tell you. And if it means that therefore I'm going to lose all of these possibilities, that's how it should be. Kane Yochum, that's what should happen. So Yohan Navi left. Understandably, now became even a bigger tumult. I used to turn out an offer like that for Tzniyas. So the Yohan Navi went back to the Bezman Shalmaila, and there was even a bigger Shturim, and the Maskana was reached. The Yohan Navi should come to him and take a teach him call the Kula without him having to reveal what he did in the day of his bar mitzvah. And that's what happened. Ayonav, he came to this person, and he taught him kol kula, and he became, you know, well, how do you explain it? A tzaddik, a gon, a kodesh, a isha lekim, a get lechaman. But he continued to live his life as he lived it until that point. Betmimus or bepashtis. His lifestyle didn't change at all. As a consequence, nobody even realized that this person had become a new man. And he lived his whole life like this, and he died. When it came to the Bezdin Shalmaila, so it's described in other places, that when a tzaddik passes away, it's an incredible simcha. All the neshamas that tzaddik can come to Makabal Ponim, it's a big simcha. When somebody dies on this side, it's not such a good plan, but over there it's a gvaldika simcha. All the neshamas that tzaddik can come to Makabal Ponim, and they brought him into the Bezdin Shalmaila, and nobody has a bad word to say about this neshama. It's neshama to chmamish, rain and shade. It couldn't be better. There was one little... One little katege, one small malachal, came to protest. And this protest was, I guess, from a, from a practical perspective, kind of pathetic, kind of weak. But it was a real complaint. How could it be? A yid should be such a big tzaddik, such a big god, such a big kodesh. And never once in his entire life did any Jew ever have anything from it. No tayelas came to Azulas from all of the incredible madreges and yidiyas hatera and 
he said it's for Avedis Hashem. Not one person ever benefited. In other words, it was completely an Avedis Yachet. It was totally personal. The Bez Neshamayla heard this complaint and Pascha that he was right. But they made the following determination that his Nisham would have to come back down again. But it wouldn't come down as Nishamas are normally born, which means to say, Nishamah comes into this world, it could be good or bad, but his Nishamah would come down into this world with the matar of revealing a new Derech and Teda, revealing a new Derech and Teda that will be based on the principle of Yehav Lerich HaKamecha, of Avaz Yisrael, which will be Mesal Aladerech, which will open up the path to the coming of Mashiach. And this is the Nisham of the Vashem in a free of Gilgal. This is the Vashem Tzor. Vashem Tzor himself tells the story in the Gini Zachar Sadis. So of course the story goes that the Vashem parents, whose names were Rebbe Yezir and Sada, Rebbe and Sada, lived in the city of Tlust. Tlust is a city, people know what Tlust is. In some places, the Baal Shem Tev describes that he lived in the city of Akup, as opposed to Tlust. Akup, how can you come from two cities, Tlust and Akup? And the tells Apashta. Baal Shem Tev came from the city of Tlust. But like all cities in the, in the medieval world, in the, in the world of, of those years, they were very isolated. In other words, there were huge tracts of forest of separate city and city. And bandits and Ganovim and Rotschim had a very easy time maneuvering and attacking travelers and the rest. So every city needed an early warning system. In other words, if there were pirates and attacked a town, they knew they couldn't get help from the outside because by the time they would get communication, the other city, there was nothing to come and save. So they built moats. You know what a moat means? A ditch all around the town, very, very deep, a big, big trench. And um, they built a bridge that could be raised, a drawbridge. And this gave people an opportunity for an early warning. In other words, if there was people coming into the town, they would have to deal with certain obstacles which allow the people to mobilize. In, in Ukrainian, this is called Akup, Akupi. I was in Moscow. There's a street in Moscow, in the center of Moscow, called Sushovsky Val. It's a big circle. It was very strange to me because the whole city is more or less a grid, you this round street. And the Russian taxi driver explained to me that this used to be the border of Moscow, the ancient city of Moscow, when Moscow was at a country unto itself, and this was the moat. I think Val in Russian means moat. This was the moat. They filled it in. It became a road. Anyway, so the, the poorest people in town couldn't afford to build homes. So they climbed into the moat, and they lived, in effect, in shacks. Shacks. The Bresach, you ever see shanty towns? It's, it's unfortunately nothing funny about it, but they would, the Baal Shem Tov was born literally in the hole in the ground. I mean, Nishka Guzman. And this is what the Baal means when he says he comes from the city of Okup. Baal Shem Tev came from the city of Tlust. But his parents were very poor. And as a result, they didn't have a house. They push it. This way you save yourself walls. You don't have to build walls. You don't have to worry about elements. There's not so much wind and so forth. Baal Shem Tev's parents climbed into this moat. And they did whatever they had to do to make some kind of an accommodation. You have to understand, moat is the lowest point in the city. So the water collects there. So you have to build some kind of an elevation. And um, this is where they lived. Now, in this, this two sikhs, to push it, in one place, the Fididik and writes that Bashem's parents were incredibly poor, as I just indicated. But in another place, it says Bashem's parents were well to do. And I have a suspicion that this is not a stira. <laughs> they were very, very poor, but that's a gehazen compared to everybody else, well to do. And they were Murindik and Machnis Eirech. They had no children. They were very old. Very, very old. The Fididik and has a Rishima, which he copied from a Yeshish mi Dabra Misl, as he described it. Who copied it? Miksaviat kachet al terebe. There's a tzedek from Friedrich and Rebbe, which is copied us by us from a, a, a note that he found by an old, the Bremisle Yid who was a ben by the Malkin Rebbe, and he copied it from Malkin Rebbe's tzedek. And it said on this piece of paper that the Baal Shem Tov's father was a hundred, and the Baal Shem Tov's mother was ninety when the Baal Shem Tov was born. And everything about his birth was shalei gederach ha'ilad was totally supernatural. But the beginning of the story is that it was a Shabbos afternoon in Tlust. And a man marches into the town. A yid comes into the town. Coming into a town on a Shabbos morning obviously meant there was a Machal Shabbos. And a Machal Shabbos for Hesir because he had crossed the Tchum and the rest. And in those days, they didn't have uh, tolerance for Freya Yidin because you were either a Frum Yid or you were a Meshumet, you understand? 
if you were not keep it at a mitzvah, you, 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 you essentially uh, adopted the Goyish way of life, Christianity, and they had absolutely no sensitivity whatsoever to such people. So he comes into town and right away the whole town is whispering, look at this, a goy. This is how they refer to these people, a goy. I mean, you read about the, the old town Jewish mentality. It was quite brutal. You know, they used to have a little cage near the shul. This is not funny at all. They would put you in this cage. People would come and spit at you. It was part of the discipline. People went into this cage. If they, the famous story of Hashem also about somebody who got out of that cage and spent the rest of his life tormenting Jews. And... Um, he shows up in town, and right away, everyone has a shushkin. And they believe, yes, it's like a of him. He comes over to him in shul and gives him good Shabbos. So now they're shocked at the Rebbe uh, making the acquaintance of what, in effect, was a goy. And uh, the Eta Davening, the Rebbe had his whole line of guests that went to him to his incredibly wonderful accommodations in the Akup. And he invited this person to come join him for the Shabbos meal. So, uh, his father. And uh, he took him home, and all the guests are following behind, and he's favoring him. He's talking to him, he's sitting down next to him, and the more the people are treating him inappropriately, the more the Rebbe is kind to him. This goes on till the end of Shabbos. After Avdola, he asks Rebbe to come outside, and he tells Rebbe Yezid that he should know that he's a Yohanavi, and that he was sent to test him. Because a special neshama has to come into this world who is going to light up the world with a new derech and teda based on the principle of Yahav Kalecha Gomeicha of Avos Yisrael as the preparation for the coming of Mashiach. And he was sent to test him to see if he's ready to be the parent of such a child. And he told him, you, you pass the test. You can have a child taka who's, who has a special purpose. But I said to you before, when the Baal Shem Tov was born, his parents were 190 respectively, which means to say it was completely supernatural. They had never had children. She had been in Akkara. And uh, of course, we know his birthday is Chayelo. The Baal Shem Tov revealed, the Rebbe, the Fidikab revealed, what he heard from his father and so forth, that the birthday of the Baal Shem Tov was Chayelo. And the Fidikab Rebbe makes a startling observation. If you count backwards, nine months to the day from Chayelo, what do you get? Yutes Kisler. If you count backwards nine months from Chayel, you get Yutes Kisler, which is very interesting. But the Fidik Rebbe immediately adds that Sayyid Al Tareb and Sayyid Baal Shem Tov were born in the Shnas Ibar. Shnas Nachas, when Baal Shem Tov was born in 1698. And Shnas Kahas, 1745. Al Tareb was born in Ibar Yod. Which meant that nine months is not Yutes Kisler, it's Yutes Tevis. And the Fidik Rebbe says that by Tzadikim, the Ibar is an extra month. Now, I want you to understand that there's two concepts of Ibud by a neshama. There's the Ibud of the goof, especially the physical pregnancy, and then there's also the Ibud of the neshama. The Ibud of the neshama is all different types. We learned about it in the Samach Vav, seven months, nine months, 12 months. By a neshama chadash, it's 24 months. This, Pashat, means the Ibud of the goof. It takes Pashat, it's a longer pregnancy, 10 months. Pashat was born Chayalu, and his parents named him Yisrael. And it says in the Sikhs, why were they given the name Yisrael? Because in the time of the Baal Shem Tev, the world was in a matter of his alphas. The whole world was in a state of faint. And when a person is in a matter of his alphas, there's different aetis, different things you can do to bring the person out of their faint. And if I may use my own words, one is to strengthen the goof, and the other is to reach out to the neshama. The way you would strengthen the goof is by giving them a smelling salt, a very strong smell which sort of shocks their body back into consciousness. And when you want to strengthen the neshama, you whisper their name into their ear. When you whisper a person's name, the name has to do with emek and nefesh. And it's, it's mam shech tzirik, the helam of the nefesh, into a state of gili. The Rebbe tells the story by the Fidik Rebbe, there was a woman who was very ill. And she was in a coma. And they came to the Fidik Rebbe and they told the Rebbe about the Fidik Rebbe to go to that woman and whisper into her ear the Rebbe's name. The Rebbe's name. And they did it and she, re- she came out of her coma. So the Rebbe once explained that when a person's neshama is in a state of helam, by calling their name, you're revealing it. But sometimes the helam is so deep, it doesn't even help calling their name. You have to call the shredish of that name, which is the nasi ador, because all the neshamas are there, come from the nasi ador, rish b'nei Yisrael. So the Baal Shem Tev was called Yisrael, because the world was in a matter of his house. The Jewish world was in a condition of faint. And the Jews need to be revived from their faint. And the way you revive a Jew from a faint is by calling him by his name. And the name of Yidin is Yisrael. The Baal Shem Tov's presence in this world 
just as being in the physical world, was calling to every yid by the name Yisrael. The Baal Shem Tov was a wunderkind. And this is not stam as a very well advanced. In this regime of Lefriyadik Rebbe that I mentioned, which he copied us by us from Hayashish Midabra Missal, who copied it us by us from Ksav Yad Kotcher, the Alter Rebbe himself. It says that the Baal Shem Tov at the age of three months, three months, could talk and walk. This is biologically impossible, scientifically cannot be. If you understand the nature of a human baby, human babies have very, very big brains, much bigger than any other animal. And as a result, that's why you're born with a soft spot. And why a human baby is born with a soft skull? Animals are not born that way. It's because the brain is still growing with passion. So if the skull was hard, there'd be no room. The brain continues to grow. For the first six months of a child's life, they are, in a way, still growing as most babies grow in their womb. That's why human babies are the least developed. They're completely helpless at birth. Because, in other words, biologically, a child of six months old is literally developing their brain mass. And consequently, their, their ability to use their nerves and, you know, at three months to walk and talk is And his whole childhood was that way. Of course, he was raised by his father, who was a big tzaddik, and a member of the Zik and the Stadim, which we'll get to later on. The unfortunate truth of the matter was that his parents passed away when he was very, very little. How old was the Baal Shem Tev when his father passed away? He was certainly not any older than five. Conceivably, he was much younger than five. It's hard to know exactly because it's hard to figure out the years. But the Baal Shem Tev was very little when his father passed away. Three, four, five episodes, as they say in Yeshivish. And um, before his father passed away, his father called him to his bedside. And his father told him a tzavah, an oral will, Baal And the will consisted of two lines. This is very, very famous. He said to him, Yisraelit, You should be afraid of nothing and nowhere except for Eivishter himself. And you should love every Jew with all the depths of your soul. So the Friyad Yikirab has a sikha where he tells the story and observes that in these two statements, you have the whole chesidus. In other words, what the Baal Shem Tov's father told him really was the most distilled version of kola chesidus kula, because chesidus has two principles, achdas Hashem and the incredible preciousness of Ayid. So fearing nothing except for God is achdas Hashem, and loving every Jew with all depths of his soul is Baal Yisrael. So the Baal Shem Tov really got from his father everything that he would teach his whole life as a child. Baal was pure and sincere in an indescribable way. He was almost like a neshama without a goof. Remember, he came into this world not with the regular halam is vestated. His neshama was pushed revealed in his goof, even at that early age, unbelievably sensitive. So he took his father's words incredibly literally. And it's described how his mother used to schlep him for talk to say kadosh to his father. She was an old lady. She was in her 90s. And as soon as he sent his Kaddish for his father, his mother passed away. And he was saying Kaddish for his mother. And of course, in those days in the Shtetlach, there were, there were unfortunately many orphans. When he was five, he was saying Kaddish for his I don't know exactly when his father passed away, but let's say he was five. So as soon as he finished saying Kaddish for his father, he sent Kaddish for his mother. In those days, in every Shtetl, there was orphans. Life was very, very hard. After Tach it took them 50 years, there were people who got married very late. And they had the children born, you know, people who were in their senior years, and second marriages, and all kinds of strange arrangements. And the consequence of this was that there were many, many children who were parentless. And then there many people who couldn't afford to take care of their kids. So the community took care of these children. And the community was terribly impoverished itself. Not exactly like Klus was like this multi-million dollar city. It was a shtetl. But they took care of the Yosemim to the best of their limited abilities. People gave stalker. They had to give them a house to live in. Give them a bed to sleep in. They gave him clothing and, and uh, blankets. And I don't know if they had a Yiddish imam coming in to kiss them at night and say Kishma with them. But they made sure that they didn't die, basically. They sent them to Chayde. But it wasn't exactly uh, a regular life. And then a shaman like the Baal Shem Tev, a person who was so unbelievably sensitive, living amongst regular people in a hard world, he pushed it, couldn't take it. The Baal Shem Tev absolutely hated his childhood. In other words, once his parents passed away, he was living with regular people. 
people's backstabbing and people's gossiping and people's jealousy and people's vengeance. He just couldn't handle it. Even amongst children. I mean, children don't know enough to be subtle about these things. And the Bashem Tev Poshet could not deal with it. So he would run away. Imagine a kid five, six years old would disappear. Not for an hour or two. For days at a time. The first time he disappeared, you understand what happened. The whole city was mobilized to go look for the lost child. They went into the forest. He's off the hing, he's off the head. They probably started to say in Kaddish for him. Two days later, he shows up in town. Perfectly calm and collected. Not a worry in the world. No hysteria. And the people gather around him and they say to this little boy, you know, we've been looking for you. We sent out the, the police. Where were you? He said, I was in the forest. He says, what did you eat? I found the berries. I said, drank water from a brook. Where did he sleep? He slept on the forest floor. He says, you weren't afraid? Me afraid? And my father told me before he passed away, I should fear nothing except that Abish did himself. But was literally how he lived his life. Bipashtas. So the Baal began to be viewed as a strange person. As a character to be feared. And parents told their children, stay away from him. He's uh, eat either half baked or baked a time and a half. Of an epistat in his nisht, to say that. And there's a story which is brought that Vashemta once took a bunch of children on a hike into the forest as a child, and they came across a big bad wolf. And let me tell you something a big bad wolf in a forest is a lot bigger and a lot better than a big bad wolf that you'll see behind the cage in the zoo. And the kids went into a panic, and the Vashemta didn't understand what they were so afraid of. And he said to them, My father told me before he passed away, you should fear nothing to the Abish himself. Why should you be afraid of the wolf? But the Baal Tov, this was Pashit. So when this happened, so the Baal Tov was ostracized. A little boy was considered crazy. And I suppose in those days they didn't have a lot of tact. And the Baal Tov knew this is how he was perceived. And it was very difficult for him. Very, very difficult. They sent him to Cheder and Kvayach, he had no Hatzlach. The whole thing was a disaster. How long this went on is also unclear. Two years, three years, less, more, I don't know what it is. But the Hemshech HaSipur is as follows. But let me just tell you one more story. On one of these sojourns into the forest, one of these trips away from town where there was no people, and no lechilas, no Russian hara, no jealousy, no vengeance, Shem was walking in the forest, and he came across an estate, a palatial estate, a big gigantic estate. He had been many times before in that space where he, where he was. He never saw the, fire, the palace before. So he enters into this palace and he sees Yidin. Shroom a Yidin. But give us a bed. Shane Kaiser the Payalach, Lichtik a pen in me. And the Vashemtiv is greeted very warmly by these kids who are playing outside in the front of this palace. And they bring him inside and everyone is so happy to see him. And then he meets the adults until he comes into the very center of the palace. And he's thinking to himself, how could it be that I missed? So many Yidin living together, the Shalom, the Shalva, the Simcha, they looked so holy and so wonderful. How come I never saw it before? Until he meets the Zakan, the sage in this group. And the sage says to Hilke Baal Shem Tev, Yingele, Zog, Ozav, Havaye, Sa'aretz. Little boy, say that the Abish has abandoned the earth. This whole event was a mirage, it was a... a and Achiza say naim, it wasn't real. And this was, as they say in Yiddish, the Nitkute with Kech of Klipe, who was hoping to destroy the Baal Shem Tev before he would have a chance to become the Baal Shem Tev. So he says to him, little boy, say the Ebesh that abandoned the earth, which is exactly the opposite of what Chassidus teaches. So the Baal Shem Tev screamed out, all doers of evil should scatter. And in a second, the Baal Shem Tev found himself standing in the forest, and everything was gone. The palace and the people and the payalach with the lift of the and all things was gone. And Baal Shem Tov did the right thing as a little boy. On one of his sojourns into the forest, he walked deep into the forest and he heard noise. And of course, since the Baal Shem Tov was fearless, and he literally was fearless, he went in the direction of the sound. And he came across a yidan. In the middle of the forest, standing by a tree, a thousand tomb, and davening with the shtap nefesh, davening like a tzaddik. Now, this the Baal Shem Tev related to because this was how he saw his father daven. 
And the Baal to realized that this is a special man at Tzadik Nistin. So he sat down behind a tree so this person shouldn't see him. And he listened to him down. Took hours him to down. When he finished davening, this Yid sat down on a tree trunk. And he took out a Gemara, you know, we him. He had a shir, he learned whatever his shirim were. And after he finished learning, he took off his talis and tzum, took out mamsha, a hard piece of bread. He went down to the river. It's Hagavashim. He washed for bread. He ate his bread by tunking it into the water. He ate his meal, which was kam kam a meal. He benched. He put everything back into his little sack, his torbe, his little satchel he carried over his shoulder. He girdled his waist, and he got up to go. As soon as he was about to leave, the Heilig Gavashem comes out from behind his tree, and he goes over to this stranger and tells him, Shalom Aleichem, Rabbi Yid. This Tzadik Nister was very startled, because he figured that he was discovered. He was afraid initially that someone had followed him from the nearest city, and that they discovered that he was a Tzadik Nister, so he was very disappointed. But then he started to talk to the little boy, and he realized that no, he wasn't followed from the previous city. This is Pasha the child from someplace else, from a different place. So he says to the little boy, What are you doing here? He says, I like the forest. He says, Why do you like the forest? In the forest there's no Rechilis, in the forest there's no Roshan Hara, in the forest there's no Kine, in the forest there's no Shine. It's the Abishta's world. So I like the forest. And um, the man says to him, from which city do you come? She tells him, say, you're close. We hate thy tate. What's your father's name? My father hates the name of So this nista says, I knew your father. Because his father also was a nista. Kum lomer lenin. Let's learn. And in the story it said, they took out a gemara p'sochem, but they stayed in the maizim. It's from the Gniza HaChashamist also, I think. I think maybe not Gniza, but they took a gemara p'sochem. And they sat down on a, a log, they learned a meshach man. And apparently this person realized Midem and Hatzatan, so he says to the Baal Shem Tev, if you wish, you can come with me. If you want, you can come with me. And if you don't want, you can go home. I'm just asking you that if you go home, you shouldn't repeat to anybody what you saw. To the Baal Shem Tev, the happiest words he ever heard in his entire life were those words, if you wish, you can come with me. The Baal Shem Tev was so desperate to get away from the town because he was so unhappy. He was so misunderstood. And he... He, you know, as a Rebbe, the Baal Shem Tev's whole Indian was Sefer Trogen Yenem is Mishagaz. But as a child, the sensitivity of the Baal Shem Tev, Pasha did not allow him to live amongst people who were not as sensitive as he. And it was very difficult for him. And uh, he was, you know, where do I sign? He, he joined with this Tzadik Nistif. And he told him, Vim Adaf you have to behave like a shnader, like a beggar. Nobody's allowed to know. But when we're alone, I'll teach you. And that's what happened. They traveled for six months from place to place. And wherever they came, they slept in a base medrash, and they collected arms. Most of the money they didn't even use for themselves. They went to Pidin Shuyim. And when they were alone, they would learn. And for Shtetzach, they had their moments and people would make fun of them and throw rocks at them. Part of being a shnader was that you were a butt of people's jokes and so forth. And uh, Bashantav learned the life of a tzaddik nist. But he also learned that tzaddik and the starter were not just isolated people who were just living this pious life in isolation. He learned that there's a network, there's a whole group. And periodically they would meet other Tzadik in the Stardom, they would come to certain places where there'd be a whole meeting of Tzadik in the Stardom because there was a leader and there was a vision and there was a purpose and the wandering of Tzadik in the Stardom had a deeper and a higher kavana. After six months, he brought him to uh, the home of an oven maker. Mid it says the man's name, but I don't remember it. An oven maker was a very good profession for a tzaddik nister. If you, wanted to be, if you want to be a tzaddik nister, start making ovens. But the problem is today they don't make ovens like they made in the old days. Ovens were made from clay. Which meant to say that an oven maker needed a lot of mud. So as a practical matter, oven makers live near swamps. In other words, where people, nobody wants to live near a swamp. Because it's perpetually wet and muddy. So an oven maker, by, dis, by, by profession, lived away from everybody else. No, no one saw it as strange that a person who made a living collecting clay lived where nobody wanted to live because he lived where the clay was. But it was a perfect cover for a tzaddik nister because nobody went there. So this man's home was, for lack of words, it was a strong house. Tzaddikim nistarim were constantly coming and going. 
Some came and gave money, dropped off money. Some came and picked the money up. Some came and left messages. Other people came and collected the messages. And the Vashem Tev was left in the home of this Tzadik Nistir, and he stayed there until Bar Mitzvah. And this man was Mechanach Tahir Gabal Shem He taught him Tehidah. I mean, the Vashem Tev, you know what I'm saying, he's not like a regular person, you know. 20 years to finish Shas. <laughs> Try 20 days. I mean, it's an undersat, Bashaf and the Shingans. And the Vashem Tev lived in this man's home until Bar Mitzvah, and he got a very close up perception of the world of the Tzadik and the and they have a leader. And his name is Rabbi Adam Baal Shem. And Rabbi Adam Baal Shem organized the Tzadik and the And they were going on these different missions. Mostly to Pidgin Shoyim. Yidin were very poor. As you'll see later on in the story, Yidin had a lot of Tzadis. And the Tzadik and the... And oftentimes they couldn't pay their debts. And you couldn't pay your debts. So they threw you into a pit. You, your wife, and your children. Until, until whatever happened, happened. And the Tzadik and the Tzadik would wander around. They would find where Yid was never in a boy, they would come for it with money and redeem him. But as you see later on in the story, it was very, it was a, it was very, very apathetic, very helpless, because as many people as you helped, there were more people going. To, it was a never-ending cycle of poverty and pigeon shvuyim, which was going no place. It, it didn't seem to show any relief, any possibility of, of, uh, of, uh, of redeeming itself, of, of healing itself. It just was a cycle of poverty and tzaddis. And, and the Vashem wanted to become a member of the Tzaddik and Nistarim, but there was a, uh, you know, a, a strict policy that allowed nobody under Bar Mitzvah to be a member of the group. So the Hashem said, Pashat waited desperately for his Bar Mitzvah that he could become a Nistar, a Tzaddik Nistar. Bar Mitzvah, of course, was the very end of Tafayin Aleph. Chayal Tafayin Aleph, 1013. So his 14th year was Tafayin Beis. And this year, of course, is exactly 300 years since then. And people have said that Taf Shin, Ayin Beis, is Shnas Tavri Alav Brach. Now, I'm not into the Rashi Tevisin. You know, I, I, the ones that the Rebbe gave us, the Rebbe gave us, I'm not into the creating new ones. But this one you don't have to create because the Baal Shem Tev said, I'm saying, Fidi Kebbe writes in the Sikh, that then, Talmidi Baal Shem Tev, Chaveri Baal Shem Tev, the Tzadik in the Stodom, used to say that Tov, I in Beis, Shnas Tov, I love Bracha. I heard from the Rebbe in the Fabrik. So if Shnas Tov, I in Beis, is Tov, I love Bracha, Tov, Shin, I in Beis, to be Shnas Tov, I love Bracha, is not at all such a ridiculous uh, conjecture, a ridiculous uh, carrying over in result. And there's a reason why Tafayim Beis was considered Shnas Tavya Lovdracha. And I'll continue, Mr. Shaman.